With In a Major Way, which comes out in 95 and is at that point the national breakthrough for E40, for Sick With It, really for, I would argue, all of you, <laughs> how, <laughs> how did, what changed? Like, how did things change musically, business-wise to where you were able to capitalize on this years of work you guys have been putting in within a major way? Well, I think what changes is it became business, a business then. Up until that point, we were, even, but even those songs, those songs were still like hobbyists, but it was, a, like I said, it was a lot more serious, but it turned into a lot more business. So we started trying to be, or we, we became more businessmen instead of producers and musicians and artists, you know what I mean? We started like paying attention. Okay, now we're going to start really making some money. We need to make sure we got this. How many points do you have on this? How many, how much of the percentage of the song did you write? It just became business. So it kind of degraded and took away, you know, uh, uh, some of our um, musical stuff, you know what I mean? By having to be so businessy, businessy, you know what I mean? So we started having to pay attention to other things because now we're being bombarded with other pieces of the industry that we need to be aware of. So now let's try and figure out what this publishing means. Now let's try and figure out uh, how many points we're going to get. Let's try and figure out what, you know, we started chasing down other things and spending more time chasing other things down versus staying in the music thing. And, you know, because we were all learning, there was no blueprint for this stuff, you know what I mean, on how to move and how to operate. We didn't know that. You should have a lawyer to have to do this. You should have an accountant to do that. You know what I mean? We're just musician, producer people, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it changed us, you know? It changed our whole thing. And it just went from a passionate hobby to a business hobby, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So it kind of changed it. Now, on In a Major Way, one of the songs that you did was The Dusted and Disgusted and Pox on there, Mac Mall Spice One. But the other thing that I thought was interesting, at least to me and at the time, was that the drums were much more in the foreground and they were much harder than mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff in particular you had done, I would argue, with 40. Um, one, did you feel that way? Do you think that's true? And if so, do you remember why you decided to make them much harder and more prominent on Dusted and Disgusted? I think that... Uh uh, I think that why they were it was, that was about the mix you know it's the way to mix so when you have that kind of money we're being mixed by real people that are you know not, not necessarily realer than others but we're mixing on SSLs versus Tascam mixing boards you know what I mean we mix on a million dollar console now versus we were mixing on you know hundred thousand dollar mixing boards so these you know the engineers had different ears at that time you know what I mean so and the mastery, you know what I mean? They, they mastered it. It's, we got more money to play with at this point. So, of course, it, it got, it boosted the, you know what I mean? <laughs> it boosted all of the drums and stuff. But that song was just, it just was um, drum heavy and, and the sounds were so simplistic. The production was so simplistic on it that that's what made the drums stand out so much more because it wasn't a whole bunch of musical stuff going on like that. It just happened in pieces. And the drums was hitting the same time as the bass was hitting, you know what I mean? But the but the bass was stacked with two or three different sounds. So it just made it feel and sound bigger than what it really is. You know what I mean? But like I said, we've been practicing up into that point to know how to get the beefier and, and a bigger sound. You know what I mean? We start knowing about knees and processors and you know what I mean? Stuff like that to make it punch that much more. You know, everybody, it was just a sense of urgency on, on a major in a major way. We really felt like we had something to prove, you know what I mean, at that point to everybody, you know? Yeah. And then Sprinkle Me, of course, which you also produced and mixed is on there as well. And that's the breakthrough song. But what, when it started breaking, because we even in Maryland at the time, you know, we had, they had made go-go remixes of Sprinkle Me and I couldn't believe Did it. They? Yeah. Wow. And they played them on the radio. And e E40 to that point had never, to my knowledge, or ever hearing, because people would always, you know, people knew I love rap and knew a lot about it. So they'd always be like, Soren, you hear this yet? You hear this yet? And I'd always tell them yes or no. But I had never heard E40 on the radio 
in DC or Baltimore until Sprinkle Me. And then they remixed it with Go-Go and I got even more radio play. Um, so that being said, I want you to explain in the 95 era going from doing these great independent records that are largely regional, but are getting love around the country to then getting some significant radio play like Sprinkle Me was getting it and video. Of course, that's also very important to video play. But how did things change when that was happening? Well, um, you know, that, that was a different kind of success. You know what I mean? So we were, I mean, me and Sam were, we were always into have trying something different and new. And always, we were always trying to get 40 to try and do something different and new. And 40, you know, he wanted to, he didn't want to really do that. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't really, I ain't really, you know, but we was like, man, just try it. Just do it. Just do it. You know what I mean? And so and it's always when, that's why I tell songwriters, um, you need to be in a room full of other songwriters, or if you're a producer, you need to be in another room of other, of other producers because you don't know what you may think you know it all, but you may learn a trick or two. And if you just try some stuff, or you may, you know, something that this next person's doing may end up working out for you, but you would have never known that if you hadn't opened up yourself to being in the same room with these people. So that's what my philosophy has been. So that's why we were like trying to tell 40 and 40 from that day on 40, you know, it never was, you know, scared to try anything different or try anything different. You know what I mean? Musically, you know, he felt comfortable with, you know, listening to it at that point that much more, you know, because it the song came out and Jai pushed it around. We wouldn't have thought it was no big. We didn't think it was going to be a single like that. We just thought it was, hey, you know, this is a dope little track. Just try it. Let's see what happens. We just, you know, trying to be funny. You know what I mean? We're just working on some stuff. But we thought it was a dope groove, you know, but. Or you're like, nah, I ain't really feeling that. You know what I mean? But it turned out to be one of the biggest songs. You know what I mean? But that's how it happens. It's always like that. It's the song you least expect because you don't know what everybody else is going to like or see outside of yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And Sprinkle Me also has the piano like you have on the Bumble. And for you, when you uh, add the different sounds, like a piano, for instance, that, or at least a keyboard or organ or something like that, mm -hmm. Um, since a lot of my favorite rap songs have those elements to them, what do you think that that adds differently sonically to make things important or make them stand out as a listener? Um, I think that, um, I think that it separates you from all the other music. You know what I mean? Most people aren't even doing having piano parts in there. You know, especially back then, you know what I mean? Nobody was really having that kind of stuff back then. And Sam, that's, you know, that's the Sam thing. Sam really, like I say, he's a, he was an R&B dude, you know what I mean? Super R&B prodigy type dude. So he really knows how to work certain piano parts, you know what I mean? To, to make them stand out as accents and as hits, you know what I mean? And it, it just, I think it really adds to the track you know what i mean so that's that's why we keep it that's why we was keeping a lot of that stuff in there you know what i mean but if you notice a lot of that stuff will be stacked with other stuff you know what i mean i was stacking with a lot of other stuff so okay. it's there but it's not you know what i mean it's 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 cool it's a cool little sound but it's still a bunch of strong beefy stuff around that little small light sound you know yeah <laughs> so you kind of like getting all those people different type of people listening to you know i like piano sounds okay here piano is i like bass sound okay here this is you know yeah it's like a mixture of sounds that we put together gotcha so now with with this success and you know having years of working with 40 years of working with bo at the time how did you did you ever like hey man you should do a song about this or oh you know why don't we do something like this was it only did you stay strictly on a musical suggestion or did you guys start talking more bigger things of like, Oh man, why don't you do this uh, thematically type of things? Yeah, we did. We did. We talked about, um, I think the story, you know what I mean? The song of the story, I think 40 did, you know, we would have suggested, man, just try a song like this. What do you do? You know what I mean? So yeah, we always did that with 40, you know what I mean? Always, you know what, let's try and do one about this. You know what I mean? That's why a lot of, we did a few songs that were kind of like heartfelt songs, you know what I mean, too, you know, 
Uh, we didn't just want to just stay in that, you know, that grimy mob mode all the time. You know, that's what me and Sam were. You know, we were more trying to be some, we were trying to give them everything. You know, let's just see what, like, that goes back to let's see what works, you know. So mm-hmm. Sprinkle Me was good, so let's keep trying this, you know what I mean? Gotcha. Now, yeah. with, with moving on with Sibo, with Tales from the Crypt, I was trying to understand. I assume, but uh, that's why I'm asking <laughs> Mike and Mike and Sam. Why did you guys go by that on the credits uh, from Tales from the Crypt as opposed to using your full names as you had through everything else? That was that was just a that was just a technical error to just slip through the crack. You know what I mean? We didn't we didn't say it or tell them to do that. That was just something that just happened. So, you know, so I don't know who was in charge of doing an artwork or graphic at the time, you know, somebody, whoever did it, that's just what they put on there. And that's what the final print ended up being. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause I, yeah. when I first saw it, I was like, man, who's Mike and Sam? What have- oh. <laughs> but then I was like, it's gotta be them. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's gotta be them. Yeah. And at yeah. this time with tales from the crypt, you know, Bo, uh, and obviously even long before this time, he had been, in and out of the system so much how were you guys how did that affect your workflow how he worked how you guys worked with him balancing all the other stuff you were doing because from knowing Bo myself especially a little bit after this time when I actually started meeting him and spending time with them schedule wasn't always the thing that you could rely on not rapper time I'm talking about legal time so how did you guys navigate that well it just was as simple as whenever Bo come out, we're gonna go to work. Whenever he's gone, y'all doing something else. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't nothing that we could plan a time. You know what I mean? We just had to wait till he got out. And then when he got out, it was like, okay, Mike Bo is out. He's gonna. We, where you at? You know what I mean? It just so happens, okay, we T we free around this week or that week. You know what I mean? Then they will come through. Then it was to come sit down or y'all got to go to studio in Oakland. You know what I mean? I need y'all to go to work on this particular album so we would you know that's that's how it ended up happening with Bo we were like oh man he's gone again you know we just gotta wait till he get out you know <laughs> so okay that's, that's yeah that's that's all that was it wasn't really because nothing was scheduled then you know what I mean we all like I say we all was winging it you know whenever it happens it happens <laughs> it is amazing too that Obviously, you're working hard and you're doing all this stuff, but the a level of success you can have by winging it is yeah. phenom- is phenomenal. So, congratulations! <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. You know? And then with the the Hall of Game, I was interested too because some of the songs you only mixed on them, like Record Haters, for instance, um, mm-hmm. and you mixed with other people too, with Rick Rock, Carlos, yeah. but what what was it about uh mixing to where rick rock or e40 even if you didn't make the beat or produce it that they still wanted you to work on it uh you know the post-production stuff um because they 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 knew that i had the ear you know i mean they trust my ear like you know they man we gotta make sure mike make sure that this stuff is right you know i mean or in rick rock mike can you help me make sure that this is whatever i want want your input you know what i mean or on this you know so that that's pretty much what that was about. You know what I mean? They them just wanted me to be a part of and have this final touches in on it as well with them. You know what I mean? Just okay. to make sure, you know, having some extra backup, you know? Okay. And yeah. at, th- at this time with in a major way with the hall game, 40 and Tupac were collaborating a lot too. million dollar spots, another example of their work together. So mm-hmm. what, what made them, from the outside looking in and seeing them together, what made their connection so strong? Um, it's, it's because Tupac was a huge, you know, E-40 fan, and he was a huge fan of, you know, me and Sam's production. And he just liked 40 as a person, you know what I mean? So he and respected his music and he respected our hustle, you know what I mean? And so he saw that what we were doing was nothing. You know what I mean? He knew we didn't have nothing. He knew that he was signed to a major label. He knew that we really didn't, you know, I mean, we were signed to a major label at some point, but early on, he knew we wasn't, you know what I mean? And we were still making just as much noise as he was, you know what I mean? And, uh, cause we were grassroots. And so he just wanted to help us 
always look back at Pac like he was always trying to make sure and help us build a career so that we can have a career. That's what it seemed like to me. You know what I mean? Looking back at how Pac interacted with us. Because he said he went out of his way to make sure that we were a part of what he was doing. You know what I mean? On that, on his level. You know, he's like the hand, like pulling the hand up. He always had, you know, that picture where his hand reaches out and grabbing somebody? That's Pac. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was trying to help somebody, you know, get to the next level if he can, you know? No, that's incredible. And I think it's a testament because, as everybody, you know, I'm sure knows, but Tupac collaborated with dozens, if not hundreds of artists in his uh, few years of recording, which always mm-hmm. blew me away that he had so many songs by himself, but then he had hundreds of songs with other artists, uh, mm-hmm. m- million dollar mm-hmm. spot from the Hall of Game yeah. being one of them. Right. Um, and, you know, I think that's just a testament to him and his uh, collaborative nature. But as yeah. far as when we were talking about samples, you had mentioned the story, which is on the Hall of Game uh, and that sampling uh, the Beastie Boys. So mm-hmm. and then, uh, you know, 40s playing a little bit off the Scarface there. There's a lot of going on in the song with these references. So yeah. um, that's always been something that I've loved about rap is like to fully understand it or to understand it on deeper levels, you have to know where all Mm -hmm. these different things come from, like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so as you make these types of songs, like the story and you got the Scarface reference, you got the Beastie Boys, you got these different things. Like, does that, Mm -hmm. how does that affect you or give you any extra sense of pride or satisfaction or like, Oh man, we were able to do that. Like, yeah. So I think, I think it was like, because we still are, passionate people right you know what i mean so we still like are caring people whatever at the end of the day so the bc so and we've always listened to other people so that's why a lot of these 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 little elements of our music come out in our songs and in our production because these are stuff that we listen to these are artists that we like you know what i mean um i remember i even used dana dane you know nightmare you know what I mean? On Nightmare, I don't think that I know I ended up meeting Dana Dane later on in life, but I don't even think he realized that we use that song, you know what I mean? But because we like Dana Dane, you know. He's so, one of my friends. Shout out to Dana Dane yeah. as always. Yeah, yeah, he's dope. So so we 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 you know just like with the Beastie Boys, we we like the, the Beastie Boys, you know, all that Rick Rubin stuff. We you know, we love all that Def Jam stuff, East Coast hip hop. <laughs> we loved it, you know what I mean? We were mad that we couldn't really be a part of it. So we had to like so we're always trying to, where I was always trying to use those elements in our songs because this is what we grew up listening to, you know? So we figured right. that's our go-to. Like, you know what? Here's a little story. So let's, we're talking about a story. Let's go use the B-boy, Beastie Boys, you know? All right. So it just, yeah. Yeah, we felt good doing those things, though. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.